Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rahman. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Absent. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Here. Councilmember Lee. Absent. Three members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Great. Today we have 18 items to consider on the revised special agenda and one on the supplemental, but many of these will be heard together, if at all, uh, in terms of reports, so we should be able to get through it all. Item one is verbal reports from the CAO, the Housing Depor Department, um, and the Housing Authority regarding the demobilization plan for the LA Grand uh, that will hopefully ensure that all residents there are continuing on their path towards uh, being permanently housed. Item two is a report from the Housing Authority regarding a request for a waiver in, of payment in lieu of taxes, or pilot, to provide services to public housing residents, uh, and an amendment to, of a waiver of pilot for calendar years 24 through 26. Item three is the ninth homeless emergency account and inside safe reports from the CAO. This was continued from a prior meeting. Item four is two CAO reports regarding the homeless emergency declaration, the first quarterly and supplemental reports. This was continued from November 1st and the 29th. Item five is a report from CAO and a report from LAHD regarding grant awards from the Strategic Growth Council 2023 Round 7 Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. Item six is a report with technical corrections related to the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development's Home Key Program Round 2. Item seven is an LHD report uh, related to a status update on the fast track loan program. Uh, and at the end of uh, me going through these, I understand that LHD will be reading some amendments into the record for this item. Item eight is a report from the Prop HHH Administrative Oversight Committee regarding an amendment to the HHH fiscal year 2021 project expenditure plan. Item nine is a motion regarding establishing a citywide process to apply for encampment resolution funding from the state of California. Item 10 is a motion regarding jail in reach programs in connection with people experiencing homelessness. Item 11 is a motion um, from Council District 7, Councilmember Rodriguez, regarding peer-to-peer -peer homeless youth ambassadors to connect low-income college students um, who are at risk of homelessness to supportive services. Item 12 is a motion that requires information about the use of hotels and motels across district lines for inside safe operations. And Councilmember Rodriguez, I believe you have an amendment for this item as well. If you want to read it into the record now. Yes. I'll be reading the amendment. Great, Chair. thank you. The amendment for item number 12 reads as follows. Strike the first moving clause of the motion and amend it to include the following language. I therefore move that the Chief Legislative Analyst, in collaboration with the City Administrative Officer and the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, prepare a written report 15 days before a transfer is needed for Inside Safe that outlines the number of Inside Safe operations, specifying the location and date of each operation, the number of participants placed in interim housing, and the council districts utilized for interim housing in each operation along with the nightly bed rates and daily service costs associated with the site. Additionally, the report should present data on permanent housing placements subsequent to individuals being accommodated by an inside safe operation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the rest of the items. Item 13 is a motion related to additional funding and contract amendments for an environmental cleanup at the Slauson Wall site at 5867 South Los Angeles Street. Item 14, is a motion related to an RFP for affordable housing at a city-owned property at 682 South Vermont Avenue in Koreatown, which is a parking lot. Item 15 is a verbal report from the LHD about the ULA Emergency Rental Assistance Program, as well as a description and walkthrough of the Housing Department's new publicly available housing data dashboards. Item 16 is the 10th status report from the CAO on the homeless emergency account and inside safe. Item 17 is a LASA report regarding the inclement weather shelter program. Uh, and item 18 is a CAO report regarding the homeless emergency declarations 2324 second quarterly report. So can we now have the LAHD amendment read in for item seven? And just for the record, Madam Chair, item seven is a Los Angeles Housing Department report relative to the status update on the fast track loan program. Great. And we have Daniel here from LHD who's gonna read that amendment. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, again, Daniel Wynn, Assistant General Manager of the Housing Development Bureau at LHD. Um, I'd like to uh, read the following uh, changes into record. In the summary, the fast track loan balance amount decreased from $8,617,747 to $8,617,738. Recommendation two, change from authorize the general manager of LHD or designee to reserve $19,011,308 in home funding, $4,907,109 in SB2 funding, and 971,331 in linkage fee as identified in table one, two, authorize the general manager of LHD or designate to additionally reserve 15,949,787 in home funding, 117,793 in linkage fee and 204,430 in SB2 funding as, and as identified in table one. Table one, was replaced to incorporate these changes, removing Isla de Los Angeles from home projects, including the request of 1,157,878, reducing the uh, 800, excuse me, 803 East 5th Street home amount from 7,125,000 to 5,991,969, adding from in court to the home projects with a request of $910,107, reducing the total amount from $19,011,308 to $17,630,506. Increasing the Senate Bill 2 requests amount from Isla de Los Angeles from $1,592,122 to $2,750,000 removing from in court from the Senate Bill 2 projects, including the request 910,107, adding, adding to 803 East 5th Street to the Senate Bill 2 projects with a request, with a request of $1,133,031. Increasing the Senate Bill subtotal from 4,907,109 to 6,287,911 adding a remaining fast track total line item from each source, home linkage fee and SB2, adding additional reservation request total line item from each source, home linkage fee and Senate Bill 2, adding a fast track balance line item of 8,617,738 and adding a total additional reservation request line item of $16,272,010. Um, two remaining comments. Table two was replaced to make the following changes. The subject header of the second column from total fast track expended to date to total fast track awarded expended as of December 18, 2023. The total fast track expended award was changed from 19,782,253 uh, to 19,782,262. The fast track balance was changed from 8,617,747 to 8,600,017,747 excuse me, 8 to 8,617,738. The new funds requested was changed from $16,272,001 to $16,272,010. And lastly, table three was corrected from reading table two to table three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so at this time, let's take public comment on all items. Uh, I just wanna confirm that we have an interpreter. Yes, great. Um, and we have Todd Leung here from the city attorney's office uh, to provide guidance to the public. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a special meeting, however, the agenda was posted um, indicating inadvertently that general public comment will be taken, so as such, my instructions will include that. Um, to members of the public who would like to provide public comment, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum 
up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, please be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, we will give you one brief warning. If you continue to be off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Okay, so let's start with uh, the following speakers. Dana Hammond, Arnold Sachs, Adam Smith, and somebody who's written a name that I will not write, uh, I will not read, but the, the initials are B-P-A-N-N. -N. You can come up in any, any order. You don't have to come up in that order. And speaker, your name and the agenda item you're speaking on. Yes, my name is Dana Hammond. I'm speaking to agenda, agenda item one. Okay, please, uh, you have one minute for, for that item. All right. so I'm the founder and CEO of Academy of Media Arts. My students were here last Friday. And this Insight Safe program, we have experienced a whirlwind of incidences that has had huge financial and safety implication and we have ultimately closed our doors. You heard the plea from our students. I, I need this council to understand it took me 20 years to build the school, no celebrity. I still have a 25 year lease. I've been threatened. The straw that broke the camel's back is an incident from the inside safe, a resident from the inside safe program was on LSD drugs and entered our campus. This is one of eight times we've had an intruder, and I am fearful that black and brown kids would have, it's gonna die. And so I'm, I am a, not just the CEO, I'm the mastermind of this pro, of this school called Academy of Media Arts, which prepares students for the future of work. And I had to move my students, and there will be restitution from the city. The city is paying a fugitive, who's my landlord, one, over $1 million a month. Why is the city paying a landlord, a fugitive? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker, please come to the, so B-P-A-N-N, -N, Adam Smith, Arnold Sachs, and I'll call one more, Noah Weiss and Jose Flores. Go ahead. Good morning. What, what items are you speaking on? I put 16, 18 in general public comment, but I don't think I have three minutes in me today. Okay. Um, my name's Adam. I'm from the LA CAN Human and Civil Rights Committee. Uh, and I mean, w one big thing, I know that this is like a special meeting, but it was interesting that 16, 17, and 18 got added yesterday afternoon after the original um, agenda came out on Friday. And I just, in terms of like, you know, constituents actually seeing that stuff. Uh, it's understandably hard yeah. to catch. And these are, you know, really important issues that um, are coming before this committee. So just wanted to lift that up. Um, yeah, looking at the inside safe numbers, I think it's just important to disrupt that constant narrative that calls what's happening housing. Um, and I heard the, the chair mention hoping that the people that are being, as the LA, uh, LA Grand is demobilized, that people have continued pathways to permanent housing. And like, in all of these reports, in all of these vitriolic comments, in all of these pontifications from this horseshoe, what we don't hear anything about, we hear little teases of, of permanent housing. We hear you know, we see these small numbers of people that have been permanently housed in these numbers, but we know that a lot of those are HHH beds that have come online in the last year and have nothing to do with this executive directive. So um, I just want to lift up that there, where are the pathways to permanent housing? These people that are being brought in, that supposedly are consenting to these hotel rooms when we see fences and planters coming up behind them, um, this isn't permanent housing. I'd like to see, we'd like to see the pathways. Your numbers show an 80% retention rate for Inside Safe. I'd like to know from Mayor Bass, how do you, what's the metric on housing retention in a non-permanent 
situation? What's, what's a retention look like for a hotel room? It's not permanent housing, so how can you call it retention? You got more people Thank dying. You got more people exiting the program, including 24 dead, than are currently permanently housed. Thank you. Where's the housing? Thank you very much. Um, and as our next speaker comes up, I'd like to call the rest of the speakers, BPANN, Noel Weiss, Jose Flores, Ethan Weaver, King James Lilly, Michelle A.W. Go ahead, sir. What items are you speaking on? Uh, good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. 15, 16, 17, and 18, and I didn't sign up for public comment, but that's fine. Okay, so you have two minutes. Okay, thank you. So I point out this article from Saturday, January 13th, Justice to Hear Cases on Homeless Camps. So if the Supreme Court justices are hearing cases on homeless camps, why the hell is L.A. involved in homelessness? How can L.A. City Hall and the city of L.A. all of a sudden come homelessness? What justice is going to hear a case about homelessness? It's right here in the L.A. Times. Justice, Supreme Court justice, the highest court in the nation. You had America fast forward. You had affordable care plan that would have gotten people off the street, but nobody paid attention to it. You had an opportunity to get people off the street, have a private citizen pay for the cost. Well, they screwed up. It's all this, you have this House LA, United to House LA, where are the periods? Where are you going to get federal dollars from if it's a la land? I've asked a hundred times that you've got to have periods because it's federal money. You're talking about a budget of 15, 18 billion dollars for the city. It's gone from seven, eight billion dollars. There's more drugs. It's a drug capital of America. There's more drugs. There's more homeless people. There's 90,000 homeless people living in the streets of LA. There's people in vehicles. There's droves that suck. The streets suck. There's more trash. There's more crap everywhere. It's become a ghetto. Parts of the center city are destroyed. The, the subway system is, a, is a, a place for people to sleep. This Project Room Key is a way to traffic for young kids. There's so many drugs on the streets right now. Thank you, Thank you. for your time and attention and more equality. Thank you. Next speaker, and I'll call two more names, Suzanne Hawley and Wanda Lee Evans, and that'll be our final speakers. Yeah, what items are you speaking on? Yeah, I speak on all this fucking shit and general comment. Okay, you have two minutes for the items, it's one right. minute for the public comment. So we get to Adam 11, Fat Monica's Youth Ambassadors. <laughs> and we'll note that Blah Blah and Bleel walked his dumb ass out of a meet and break Sorry, and please call. stay on the items. Yeah, in that's right. Thank Specialized you. Specialized training on how to be worthless. Fucking colleges don't teach shit. I learned more being on the streets selling crack out of my RV than these motherfuckers are going to learn in some college. Fuck that shit. Then we get to inside safe. You ain't safe. Safe about what? We should be safe from you. Sherman Oaks needs to be safe from Nithya Ramen Noodle. That's what we need. Safety from you criminals rather than having you take our money and waste it on stupid non-profit money laundering shit. Did you know, Bob, that one of Jose Weezer's former co-defendants was receiving motherfucking money from your city to I'm house sorry, these motherfuckers? I don't motherfuckers. believe this is an agenda item. If you could stick to the agenda items, thank you. God damn co-defendant Chinese corporation sorry, This isn't money on laundering. the agenda, sir. We're no Let, can we move you to general public comment? Thank you. Well, that's right there, city attorney. Join us tonight in Sherman Oaks, Blob. You watch your debate. Ethan Weaver, the next councilman for CD Paul. Let's give him a hand. That's right. That's right. Because the failed experiment of Nithya Ramen Noodle is about to end. 
as she has her greasy gray hair and her mask as she walks in the night at the Sherman Oaks neighborhood councils and the Soha as she says, I'm not afraid of you. I'm gonna build an apartment building, 50 fucking units behind your single family home. Even Bob Blob and Bleeld, as corrupt and stupid as he is, put that shit down, but you approved it. And Sherman Oaks Homeowner Association gonna be grilling you about that shit. So join us all tonight. You're invited too, Monica, but you're too fat to fit the normal Thank car. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next so speaker, please. And to everyone who's here, we can't control these public speakers. I sincerely apologize. Your name and the items you wish to speak on? Hi, my name is Jose Flores, and I'm here to speak on items one, three, and general public comment. Okay, you have two minutes for the items, one minute for the general public comment. Okay. Hello, council members and everyone present. My name is Jose Antonio Flores. I co-own and run Sky Moving. My family is a small furniture moving business in the San Fernando Valley. In regards to addressing our city's homelessness crisis, I believe we must first convincingly understand that regardless of socioeconomic background or privilege, we all face a risk in losing our homes and living on the streets, whether that is for a lapse of two weeks or two years, or if this happens next week or next decade, we all face this risk given the unending challenges of life, especially in our high cost, hustle and bustle city of LA. Thinking otherwise is incredibly arrogant and ignorant. All it would take to become homeless would be a set of insurmountable life circumstances, such as succumbing to the stresses of medical hardships and the resulting debt, returning from military service with a debilitating injury, or simply being an LGBTQ youth, ostracized and diminished by their own family. All of this is to say we must not consider homeless people as an other. It is your family, your friends, and possibly yourself, now or later, who may be forced to find restful nights in the cold sidewalks of LA. So with that in mind, I'd like to humbly suggest implementing the following ideas into current policy efforts, including collaborating with online, mar online marketplaces like Airbnb or Couchsurfing.com, where private citizens and organizations could offer sleeping accommodations for a profit, whether that be a private RV, a couch, or a bunk bed in a shared cooperative, all rentable with private funds and supplemented by vouchers funded through a cap and trade system of cooperation among all 15 LA districts, where each district could contribute financially or through the provision of physical beds to meet a minimum standard. Lastly, to deter abuse, the cash value of vouchers should decrease over time per participant. For example, a participant might offer a local Airbnb for their first month, and on their sixth month, an upper bunk at the local rec center that requires volunteer work from them, or that requires volunteer work from them. This would encourage participants to pursue their own long-term housing options. If any of this resonates, please consider reading a more in-depth article I posted on my blog, josesramblings.wordpress.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, and just a reminder, the final speakers are Noah Weiss, Ethan Weaver, King James Lilly, Michelle A.W., Suzanne Hawley, and Wanda Lee Evans. Your name and the items you wish to speak on? The Housing Authority and uh, about the home key. And thank you for getting my name right, because the president didn't get it right, but thank you for getting it right. You're welcome. Uh, there's two things that you, you really got to understand. So you have, I think you have one, you said one item, right? Yeah, so number six, the housing. Okay. I, have, I changed it from two to six. Got I don't it. know if you got it, but I changed okay. it. Okay. You have one minute, sir. All right, cool. <clears throat> Yeah, so let me get it right. Y'all said the home, the home key is for everybody to help everybody. That's a lie because I know we've been homeless for two years, three years, four years, and you got people that's coming from all over and get that, that housing uh, voucher just in one day, two days, three days. Now, let me explain something to you. If that's really what you say, this is what the mayor said. The mayor says, oh, I'm going to give you a, a voucher, and I'm going to get you off the streets, and I'm going to make sure everything's okay, and this and that. If, if that's the case, you would have thousands of people if you really had that voucher. So that is a lie. Y'all made that for you can give the outside people, these organizations y'all put together, so the people that's coming from... Uh, from where the border and all that to come over here for they can get the housing voucher and you leave all these Negroes down on the street. So don't make it seem like you're helping us or you're trying to help us or you've been helping us because you're not helping nobody that's black. And I can tell you that for right now. I know the statistics and I've been sitting there. Even the shelters can tell you why we're not getting help. It's because y'all got it all set up, but we would not be. I thought I had two minutes, but you said one minute. I don't get it. You can have one minute for general public comment. Sorry, okay, if you want to finish your thought, go ahead, sir. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, so 
basically, and the shelter already told us how it goes. Because I'm going to explain something to you. I go city to city, and I make sure I know everything and how it's going. So when you actually say, oh, this is for uh, Project Room Key, oh, you come to the shelter, and we're going to help you out. And as soon as you get there as a black man, I sit there. I said, okay, cool. Uh, let me get one of your vouchers, or what can I do to get your voucher? Oh, we don't have a voucher. I'm sorry. You have to come next month. And when we have money into the boat, with well, this guy just said there's money in the boat. But turn around, you sit back and you relax and you see 10 Latinos come in and they all get vouchers. So now we know what's really going on. So let's stop the bull crap and saying, oh, we're helping people get off uh, Skid Row. Because if it is, you would have thousands of people. Obviously, you don't know what you're doing. You probably need people like us to help you. And tell Karen, stop lying on these news and saying she's helping us because she's not helping us. Trust me, I already know how it goes. Even the shelter kicks us out. You got room for 30 people, but not 30, um, when, when 30 people just thank covered you. up. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. Next speaker, Noah Weiss, Ethan Weaver, Michelle, Suzanne Hawley, and Wanda Lee Evans. Go ahead, um, sir. What items are you speaking on? Uh, general public comment, 3, 4, and 14. Noah Weiss is my name. Okay, you have two minutes and one minute for general public comment. Okay, um, when the reports come in, uh, the oral reports, I think that's great because at least now we get some serious public input and the opportunity for questions back and forth. But I would respectfully request maybe one of you ask about the efficacy currently of the relocation fees that are allowed under the Ellis Protocol because I think they need to be raised, they need to be doubled. Um, and that's based on a market-based solution where I was just able to recover about twice the amount authorized under the Ellis Act for relocation under 13 tenants in a crossroads project. But they honestly got to be doubled, 110 million since 2007 when they were last raised. Um, please incorporate that into your analysis. Secondly, I don't see a lot about uh, efficacy of bridge home housing. Um, what's it costing? How efficient is it? How well is LASA doing? We really respectfully don't know, and, and it's hard to think, and I know Ms. Rodriguez is concerned about cost efficiency, and appropriately so. So I think we're in a situation, and the controller just had their report, December 2023, uh, December 3rd, pretty, saying pretty much LASA doesn't quite have a grip on the situation. So how, if LASA doesn't have a grip, can you people basically make your decisions? And I think if we focus in, pick a bridge shelter project. Griffith Park Bridge Shelter Project would be good. Um, pick one, have the controller do a report, financial as well as managerial, so we know. Because this idea of the bridge shelter going into permanent housing, um, I don't know that that's working. And if it is working, what's the cost? And, is there, uh, and are there other alternatives? That would seem to be the logical way to approach it. Um, in, in the last 20 seconds, I want to center on uh, Councilman Hutt's request for proposals. I haven't seen anything uh, really outside of the box here. Um, I'm speaking in terms of, for example, printing houses. Um, they can do that efficiently now, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a house. Where is that discussion? Number two, community land trust. All right. To be continued. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your attention. Thank you. Your name and the items you're speaking on? Good afternoon. My name is Michelle. Alman Ward, and I'd like to speak on item number one and general comment, please. You have one minute for the item and one minute for comment. Thank you. I am a 30-year downtown resident, 10 for effort, zero for brains, maybe. I have seen downtown rise like a phoenix in that time. Professionals, cultural development, it's become a vibrant, wonderful place to live. But in the last few years, the homeless situation the policies for handling it have turned this, our home, yes, there are people that live downtown, they've turned our home into a frightening, dangerous place. I was attacked by a man with a knife at the CVS parking lot. The school just down the street had a, a deranged person that attacked and invaded them. The children in the schools around us are walking in the middle of traffic to avoid the homeless situation. Embedding them in downtown, in the heart of our community, is not the answer. Downtown LA should not be turned into an annex for Skid Row. You wouldn't put up with that in your own neighborhoods. Is that my first minute or you my You have second one more row? minute, yes. Please continue. Please, please, with your solutions, don't look for permanizing a situation that is 
turning L.A. back into a wasteland, into a, a, a foster child of L.A. itself. It's a, it can be a vibrant economy, but it needs the right sort of policies and long-term solutions to address this homeless situation. Putting them permanently in expensive luxury housing isn't going to solve the problem, as I think we're already hearing around. And with that, I'd like to ask for your help in revitalizing downtown LA and bringing back that vibrant community, that economic viability that we used to have. But it would now we are descending rapidly into decay and back into that wasteland that we were 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. So we have Ethan Weaver, Sonia, Suzanne Hawley, and Wanda Lee Evans, and those are our last speakers. Your name and the items you're speaking on? Suzanne Hawley, item one. Great. Go ahead. You have one minute. Okay, great. Thanks. So I listened into the January 12th council meeting, and uh, Council Member De Leon asked Ms. Castro if an extension was being anticipated on the LA Grand, and she said she did not have enough information to comment at that time, which opened the door as a possibility that an extension might be requested. You've, you've heard from the school, you've heard from the neighbors, you know how impactful this is to the neighborhood. I would just encourage this committee, rather than consider any extension, to ask that the demobilization plan include relocating the LA Grant occupants to other locations than the Mayfair, if the Mayfair is not gonna be ready in this time frame, but it is critically important that we do wind down the LA Grant in the next six months. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate your feedback. Uh, next speaker, we have Ethan Weaver, Sonia, and Wanda Lee Evans. What, uh, your name and the items you're speaking on? I'm Wanda Lee Evans, Great. and um, I'm not sure that I can tell you the number, but it's really piggybacking on the last two speakers. So you have one minute for that item. Okay. That's item one. Item one, thank you. Yeah. Um, I see us doing this together because I, I, I don't judge what's happening with the, the efforts that you're making, but I do judge that you're not making the kinds of efforts that allow us all to deal with being downtown together. And I live very close to um, encampments, most of us that are talking now do, and I want those folks to have what they need, yet at the same time, I don't want to see garbage that's piled up to here every day that I walk by, drive by, can't walk by, mm -hmm. that the schools that are nearby, as she said, children can't walk on those sidewalks. I don't want to continue to see that, and I think that we need to find jobs for people to come along and clean that. If folks are gonna be there temporarily, let's have dignity for folks. I have a brother that lives on Crocker in the middle of Skid Row. I grew up in Aliso Village, went to Utah Street. I understand I want this neighborhood mm. to be diverse, but I also want it to be something that I can say I love being here. So, you know, do what you can, but change what you're doing the way you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for your comment. And I appreciate all the speakers who've come today to give their input. Um, I think it's, it's very well taken by this committee, and we will do our best to ensure that your community thrives. Uh, I think there are no other public speakers on the queue, uh, or physically in the queue either. So let's close public comment at this time. And I'm going to recommend that we take items two through 14 on consent, uh, unless there's any objections or members wanna make any comments or have any concerns regarding these. Two through 14. As, oh, two through 14 as amended. Okay. Seeing no uh, questions or concerns, can we call the roll? Council Member Robin. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. On seven? Did you say item seven? Actually, I have, I have one on five and one on seven, so maybe we take those. Five and seven. Five and seven. Hold on one second. So to confirm, Madam Chair, we'll be voting on two, three, four, six, eight, nine, 10, okay. 11, 12, 13, and 14, with 12 as amended. Okay, that's fine with me. I'm going to restart the roll, Madam Chair. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris-Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. 
Council Member Lee, absent. Three ayes, and these items are approved, the 12 as amended. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna recommend that we start with items that have been continued um, from previous, uh, previous uh, meetings, just to make sure that we do hear them today. So we have older HEA and inside safe reports, which are part of that consent agenda that we just um, voted on. But we have newer reports, which are items uh, 16 and 18. And uh, I I'd recommend that we hear both of them together and have both the CIO and the mayor's office come to the table to report. Committee members, are you on board? So you're, yeah. 16 and 18. So we're hearing 16 and 18 together? 16 and 18 together. We'll hear them first since they're both updates of previous things that we've uh, kind of pushed to this agenda and haven't heard. And I just want to make sure that we have adequate time for this. Great. So welcome, CAO. Welcome, re representatives from the mayor's office. And for the record, Madam Chair, item number 16 is a city administrative officer report relative to the HEA General City Purpose Fund 10th status report and number 18 is a city administrative officer report relative to the homeless emergency declaration 2023-24 second quarterly report okay great so um we can start off with the cao the cao's report and then turn it over to the mayor's office for their presentation good afternoon madam chair and committee members Kendra Leal with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Uh, before you have both of our second homelessness emergency declaration status report and the 10th monthly um, homeless emergency account report or HEA. <laughs> Apologies. I don't know, that's not your fault, go ahead. <laughs> the, um, the emergency declaration was um, pursuant to the Los Angeles Administrative Code Section 8.33, local housing and or homelessness emergency. The mayor reissued the homelessness emergency declaration where the mayor will continue to coordinate a citywide planning and respond with respect to, or response, I'm sorry, with respect to unsheltered or unhoused individuals in coordination with the city departments on July 7th, 2023. The approved ordinance instructed the CAO city planning and the housing department to report on a quarterly basis on the status of the declaration for the council to review when considering the renewal of the homelessness emergency declaration. The emergency declaration notes that the emergency should continue to exist if any of the three following criteria are met. One, housing supply is projected to be at least 40% below the annual housing production goals as established in the city's regional housing needs assessment. Two, there exists more than twice the number of unhoused people in the city of Los Angeles than the number of interim beds. Or three, a city increase, a citywide increase in unhoused individuals by more than 20% in a single year as reported in the annual point in time count. Currently, two of these criteria are met. Um, Relative to, to the first criteria on the housing supply being at least 40% below, the Department of City Planning reports the city is 60.9% 60, 60 below the annual production goal for the current eight-year regional housing need allocation cycle. And relative to the second criteria, where a number of unhoused people are more than twice the number of interim beds, the LASA reports an inventory count of over 17,000 and the unhoused population is 46,260, which is over double the number of available beds. In the mayor's July um, 2023 declaration, nine key performance indicators were established to review the progress in addressing these emer this emergency. Our office's report compiles data and information provided by the mayor's office, city planning, LHD, LASA, LA San, and HACLA. Um, in regards to um, the Inside Safe Initiative, which is primarily supported by the HEA or the Homeless Emergency, Homelessness Emergency Account, this um, helps address parts of the Homelessness Emergency Declaration. So to give a status update regarding the financials for this, um, 
for the for the HEA um, as a part of which was originally established on January 18th um, 2023 to address the city's homelessness crisis as a part of the fiscal year 23-24 budget an additional 250 million was approved for the inside safe program those dollars were divided in a form of a checking account and a savings account 65.7 million were appropriated into the HEA, which our office is authorized to spend at the mayor's discretion, as long as we provide monthly reports, which we have. $184.3 million was allocated into the Inside Safe Reserve account, which is technically the savings account. As of December 15th, 2023, just over $73 million has been spent since the beginning of the fiscal year from the HEA. The majority of these expenses, approximately 58.5 million, were um, for the acquisition of the Mayfair Hotel. Included in the Mayfair acquisition costs were 15.6 million in non-reimbursable costs and 42.8 million in cash flow loans. To date, of the 42.8 million, 15.2 million has been transferred back into the account. Last November, the unencumbered balance in the HEA fell below the $25 million threshold, uh, as was outlined in the adopted budget. Our office then released a transfer memo to the controller's office requesting the first $25 million transfer from the Inside Safe Reserve Fund account. The memo was re released on November 28th, and the transfer was completed on November 30th. As of today, the uncommitted balance of the HEA is $30.4 million. We anticipate that we will need to request an additional 25 million by the end of February, which will depend on the status of additional reimbursements for the cash flow, I'm sorry, for the cash flow loans. As of the date of the 10th HEA report, there were 30, there are 33 executed booking agreements with active hotels and eight executed occupancy agreements for a total of 43 agreements with uh, hotels, um, including the LA Grand, which um, is under a different lease agreement um, and has also been extended an additional six months. These agreements represent a total of 1,460 interim housing room stock. To date, over 1,100 nightly hotel invoices have been received by our office, um, which does not include damage claims. To assist with RV engagements, a total of 250,000 has been allocated to LAPD to support the initial phase of the new vehicle recycling program, which will be used to dismantle and recycle RVs that have been impounded or unclaimed and, um, in grave repair or are, excuse me, are an environmental hazard. The recommendation to this committee is to note and file um, the HEA report. This concludes my presentation and I turn it over to the mayor's office for theirs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have Deputy Mayor Jenna Hornstock here from the mayor's office for your presentation. Hi. Is this on? Yes. No? It's on. Yeah. Okay. It is on. There we go. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jenna Hornstock. I'm the Deputy Mayor of Housing. Uh, Chief Castro Ramirez is in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, so I'm very proud to be here representing our Office of Housing and Homelessness. Um, so this presentation is really to go along with the two um, HEA and HED reports before you. Um, we're going to go a little bit deeper um, into the HEA budget and how it's interacted with citywide efforts. And we also want to speak more broadly um, to the Homelessness Emergency Declaration and the efforts under the action plan that we submitted to this council in August of 2023. Uh, so I'm going to start with no noting that to solve this crisis, we need to work together to create opportunities for all Angelinos to find a home. Mayor Bass envisions a person and community-centered approach that moves with urgency to bring people inside, enhances the integration and delivery of comprehensive services, strengthens our interim housing infrastructure and supply, increases our throughput from interim to permanent housing, accelerates the development of new affordable housing development, and drives solutions that proactively address and rectify our entrenched inequities within our systems. We have found a collection of siloed systems and processes that have not brought people inside immediately and that lacked adequate and transparent data collection. Some of the flaws and challenges that we've seen that I think this council has also recognized are fragmented, uncoordinated, and inequitable approaches, right? We have different approaches across council districts, across spas at the county level with individual service providers and county departments, and we see inconsistent levels of engagement, coordination, and follow-through. 
Now there are people doing great work and we know that and we celebrate that great work, but it still doesn't always tie into the overall system in a way that allows for successful outcomes. Um, these next two challenges really tie together, which again, we've heard a lot from this council on, which is the lack of real-time data and synchronization across partners, which creates challenges for serving needs and for tracking progress. And along with that, gaps in the homeless management systems that make it difficult to achieve and measure individual progress and outcomes. Um, we know that LASA, service providers, and county teams use different data collection platforms and methods that don't easily integrate, and we need to meet system-wide reporting standards to be able to track outcomes. Finally, uh, we know that in this space, there are unique needs across a diverse population, and they required tailored interventions and housing solutions with an equity lens. Homelessness is not one size fits all, and people experiencing homelessness cross every demographic boundary. A solution that's perfect for one person may not help another one at all, which means that our system has to be able to adapt and connect people to the intervention that is right for them, in the right place and at the right time. Uh, this uh, new graphic was created to help visualize the continuum from being unhoused to housed, as well as to call out the numerous pieces that there are in the city's homelessness response. Now, this may not contain every single intervention in the city, but it's a jumping off point for building out a more comprehensive assessment. It's worth noting that the HEA that we're talking about today is less than a quarter of the city's total homelessness budget, and Inside Safe itself is just one strategy and a comprehensive approach to homelessness. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, but the only way to truly solve it is to make sure that they all fit together. So this means enhanced coordination around outreach and interim housing so that we avoid duplication and incre increase success rates. It means working together to identify missing pieces and barriers, and it means shifting investments to programs that can operate at scale rather than district by district. Um, just in preparing for one of our Inside Safe operations last week, we found that the encampment was connected to a second encampment in another district, and we were able to pivot and address both. And we need to see this ability to be flexible and work across the city keep happening. The mayor's office always has an eye on equity. No single part of the city should have all the encampments nor all of the solutions. As Mayor Bass likes to say, everyone needs skin in the game. But leveling the playing field takes time and requires everyone to come together around a common goal. So we look forward to working uh, with you all at city efforts as a whole and build out a strategy that supports the best outcomes for Angelinos. So I'm gonna move into a few slides with data. You might have seen some of this data prior. Um, and I, I wanna note this data um, tracks through uh, about either generally December 5th, sometimes we only had data um, up through November 30th. Um, and I'll note that this is December 5th. Some of the data in the HEA is a little ahead of this. So some of the numbers are updated in the HEA, but we wanted to be consistent in this presentation um, across states. So this is as of December 5th. Um, 21,694 people have brought in, been brought inside in interim housing, which is a 28% increase from 2022. And it, we, we believe this massive improvement is a testament to our collective investment in solving the homelessness crisis. And I think what's really important to note is that this number is deduplicated, um, meaning that someone may have entered an interim location and exited and then come back in. They are only counted once. And I think this was a really good improvement on data that, and, and we're continuing to work with LASA on those improvements. Um, in terms of Inside Safe, this is an overview of efforts again through December 15th, because we know we've, we've had a few more since then, but 36 operations, um, which includes additional repopulation um, efforts, um, three of them, um, and then over 2,000 people have come inside, and we have a retention rate of over 80%, which is higher than the 64% for the city's overall um, interim housing retention rate. And I, I, was our field intervention team here? think they were out in the field. I wanted to just thank them for their hard work um, that they do um, with our communities that they serve. And just note that this team really brings incredible experience. They have community relations, health and behavioral health, substance abuse, public safety, and many of them have their own lived experience. So they, the work that they do is really critical and, and is reflected in this retention rate. This next slide is an update on voucher usage. Um, when she took office, the mayor made a concerted push to have HAPA take action on getting vouchers at the door and ensuring that voucher holders find units and get housed. This resulted in HAPA bringing on both additional um, regular staff and contract staff in late February of last year, and they focused both on getting vouchers out, but also more housing navigation, which I think we've all learned is a really critical piece of the puzzle. 
Um, so this increased capacity led to over 7,700 people being permanently housed with vouchers since the mayor took office. And I just want to call out for emergency housing vouchers, which I think a lot of you know at that time we were pretty behind in meeting deadlines, um, and we had strict deadlines to get those out. Um, 2,299 have been used since the mayor came into office, and that was on top of just under 1,000 that have been used. So we're at 91% utilization of these vouchers, the emergency housing, and because of this, HUD is committing to giving more vouchers to HACLA. They're actually taking vouchers from cities that haven't performed and transferring them to cities that have. So this performance is having real impact and outcomes with the federal government. And I wanted to just underscore that this committee has actually been having HACLA report to it regularly um, with a parallel focus on this issue. So I think there's been significant pressure on HACLA from across yeah. the entire city family. Appreciate that. Um, so for permanent housing units, um, uh, over 2,300 units came online after January 1st. We estimate about 3,500 people housed, and you can see in the breakout, these are HHH units, um, HACLA um, redevelopment projects, as well as project home key sites. And we note that 2,169 of these units do count toward our LA Alliance obligations. The city has heard for years from the development community that our permitting and entitlement process is cumbersome and takes too long, which creates risks and drives up costs. ED1 exempts these 100% affordable projects from our discretionary review processes if the project is consistent with the applicable zoning and commits to bringing down the time it takes to approve projects. And again, this is older data. You've got some newer data in the HEA report. Um, uh, but we see over 9,000 units um, in the pipeline, 119 projects. 59 projects have been approved, over 4,600 units, in an average of 44 days, um, and this is for their planning entitlements. And, and we estimate the savings at six months um, for that process. This city council matched the urgency to build more affordable housing, and last June you requested that the city planning department develop an ordinance to make ED1 permanent. Our office is working really closely right now with both planning and LEHD to bring forward a permanent ordinance that addresses unintended consequences, right? With any policy where you're really making change, you're gonna see unintended consequences. So we are specifically looking at ways to add guardrails to the allowed waivers under ED1, as well as strengthening tenant protections for those impacted by new construction. We love a good copycat program. And in this case, DWP matched us, our, our ED1, and, and brought forward Project Powerhouse, which has cut the time and cost to deliver power to affordable housing projects. Um, you'll see the statistics here, about 242 projects in the expedited design and construction phases. They're also um, cost sharing for utility um, extensions in the public right of way. They've saved almost $23 million um, for projects through this program. And they have cut the development review and engineering construction timeline by 85%. This council has made very clear your commitment um, to tenant protections and strengthening these host pr protections. And in the mayor's budget and with your support, we committed over $80 million of ULA funding this year for tenant protections. I think we, we know importantly um, that over 30 million was put into the short-term emergency uh, rental assistance program, which was approved um, by you in August. And in September, LEHD launched. Um, I would add that, that council also recommended a special application period for, land, for landlords with less than 12 units to help those small mom and pops um, be able to collect rental arrears. Other programs funded are eviction defense, which is expanding our stay housed LA programs, um, additional outreach um, and education for tenants, um, as well as being to implement more robustly the tenant anti-harassment program. Uh, the mayor's fund, is a separate philanthropy that has launched an aggressive proactive outreach campaign to ensure that tenants know their rights and to connect tenants that have received notices of evictions um, with resources and support. And again, I know members of this council, um, Council Member Rahman in particular, has worked really closely um, to take advantage of these eviction notices coming to the housing department and make sure that the mayor's fund can use that to target those tenants most at risk. And you can see here in the statistics the success me, um, over 70, 175,000 tenants outreached, and of those, 18,000 that were looking for assistance got direct assistance in seeking um, federal, state, and local benefits. Um, anyone with an eviction notice is given help with response, and the Mayor's Fund launched an, uh, a new outreach effort in November um, to over 5,000 tenants that have received notices of eviction. Uh, 
The, we are also really thrilled to note that all of this work of coming together um, has allowed the city to identify and secure resources at every level of government um, and combining with our own and leveraging our own resources to house Angelino. So over 680 million in new funding. Um, I'll just call out a few, 60 million in federal support from HUD that goes directly to LASA. Uh, that is to work over the next three years. It can be used for outreach, housing navigation, time limited subsidies, permanent housing support. At the state level, over 590 million in new funding for encampment resolution and efforts to create both new interim and permanent housing. 60 million of that is our joint award um, with the county uh, for the encampment resolution grant that will bring 2,000 Skid Row, uh, Skid Row residents inside and connect them with enhanced services. Finally, oh, I'm on the wrong slide, sorry. Um, the mayor's declaration of emergency and her call to lock arms uh, to address the crisis have opened doors to a whole of government approach. This has not only brought additional funding and resources to the city, but it's opened new pathways for legislative cooperation and coordination. And I, I'm not going to read through all these, but this is just a sampling um, of some of the partnerships we've unlocked with this commitment. So now I'm going to dive a little deeper um, and go a little beyond what you see in the HEA report into some budget um, items. So first I want to note, there has been confusion around the 67 million in paid expenditures from the previous HEA report. That number has been tied directly to Inside Safe, both in terms of interim housing and our ability to match participants to permanent housing, and that is not accurate. So these next two slides are going to try to make really clear um, how the money has been spent. They cover HEA paid and obligated expenses for the first half of the fiscal year. And you're going to note that, or you'll see that the vast majority of both paid and obligated funding is for long-term investments in interim housing, not for in inside safe operational costs. So as you can see on this slide, the total obligated expenses for inside safe hotel rooms, both the nightly booking and longer-term occupancy agreements is 13.4 million. We also have the uh, LA Grand Lease Extension, that six-month extension of 12 and a half million. And then some just additional facility expenses related to the hotels, 48,000. Um, next down, we talk about our uh, investments in service provision. Inside safe participants not only gained shelter from our efforts, but they got meals, case management, housing navigation, and improved access to health and behavioral services. We've currently received invoices for 9.8 million in service provision, um, but we expect more invoices to be coming in soon. And then lastly, other inside safe, and I think our CIO team mentioned this, 250,000 went toward dismantling RVs, which we learned from many of you in our task force was critical uh, to making space to tow more RVs, um, and as well as 29,000 for LAPD overtime. So this is all related directly to inside safe spending. Uh, this next slide is showing our long-term investments in interim housing, and what you'll see is the majority of our expenditures in 2023 were for long-term investments in interim housing infrastructure. The acquisition of the Mayfair Hotel, which will bring online 294 long-term interim housing units with on-site services at 58.5 million. And again, our, our CAO team, I think, laid this out really well, but just to repeat with the, what's on the slide, 10.6 million for the real estate and rehab, 5.1 million for the first year of operations, and then 42.9 million, which were loans um, that was covering the funding that we couldn't access in time to close the transaction. That's actually gonna be um, paid back into the HEA account. On top of the Mayfair, um, we were successful in leveraging home key funds, Project Home Key 3. So we committed 31.6 million in funds to support applications for two new interim housing sites located in areas of high need. These were awarded and they'll offer another 186 units. So in total, we've gotten 480 new permanent interim housing beds that will count toward our alliance milestones. So if you look at the previous slide, we had 36 million that was directly for Inside Safe. And this 58 and a half million, which is really um, related to the Mayfair, this is about 94 million of total paid and pending expenses in the latest HEA reports. So I hope this is a more helpful breakdown. Last slide here. Uh, wanted to talk about our priorities um, moving forward that we look forward to working with all of you on um, and to continue to build out our citywide strategies to address homelessness and housing for all Angelinos. So our priorities in this next coming year are to increase throughput from interim to permanent housing. I know this is a priority that you all share as well. Um, looking at improvements in housing navigation, more vouchers, time-limited subsidies, and creative solutions. We need to build out further our citywide interim housing infrastructure, and we want to do this thoughtfully and in partnership. 
but we really know that we need long-term resources and we will center this on meeting our obligations under the Alliance Settlement. We want to ensure and enhance service delivery. We are collaborating with the county to ensure service connections are made, sustained, and gaps are filled. We want to expand the housing ecosystem. We have to strengthen our citywide housing strategies, um, including working with LEHD and HACLA, and importantly, have a housing investment strategy that I know this uh, committee is eager to bring forward. Uh, we will continue to grow affordable housing production to meet our RENA goals. We'll build out and strengthen tenant protections to keep people housed. And we know this also means supporting um, our mom and pop landlords to keep housing safe and affordable. Finally, on data and accountability, we'll continue to improve outcome reporting for housing and service delivery, and we'll ensure delivery of bed tracking capabilities citywide. So I appreciate you letting me present to you, and we're happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna just start by uh, asking for a clarification on a point you mentioned. What specifically were you taking issue with with the presentation of the finances from the earlier report and here? Sure, sure. I'll go back what was the slide. difference in the expenditures that you wanted to identify? Oh, it won't go back. Oh, there it goes. Um, so I think there was a, report, um, a reporting on 67 million being spent on Inside Safe. And I think what we're, we're trying to make clear here is Inside Safe is a part of the HEA, but not the entire program. So this is showing what was spent directly on Inside Safe. So the interim housing, um, booking agreements, occupancy agreements, and service provision, um, along with the 250,000 for RV dismantling is all part of encampment resolution. Um, and this is about 36 million. So what was being reported on the 67 million, we think was looking more at other obligations that are happening through um, the acquisitions budget. So the 250 million that was approved, which is part of this HEA and this regular reporting, it's not just inside safe, it has more than that. And so we wanted to call out that a, a good chunk of that is spent on this permanent interim housing infrastructure. Got it, okay, thank you. Ed Gibson at the CAO, if I can just provide clarification. That is in the report already, it's just being broken out for clarity for you and it is broken out in our report. I wasn't even suggesting it was CAO team. It's just across the world, we're hearing 67 million tied to inside safe. We're just kind of generally trying to make more transparent, you know, how the money is being spent. Got it. Okay, so I'm sure there's questions from committee members. So I want to open the floor to my colleagues, Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to use a term that Mr. Blumenfield uses. It uh, feels as clear as mud sometimes. Uh, and I first want to start with the fact that, yes, we've had these items, the, this report has been delayed three times. Uh, and it's missed an opportunity for us to engage in these questions that are important to perhaps recalibrate uh, the way dollars are being expended as part of all of these efforts, uh, because we haven't been afforded the opportunity to engage in the conversation. So I'd actually like to propose, Madam Chair, uh, that should we not be able to hold these conversations here in committee, that the full council should have an opportunity to dial, to dial down on it. Because this, the next tranche of money, there's tons of money being spent. And there's tons of money being spent uh, that are not in, align, in alignment to fulfill our obligations under the Alliance case. That's been made very clear. Uh, you know, we can talk about the acquisition of Mayfair, but that's, you know, and the expense associated with that. Again, I, I just, it feels a lot of three card Monty to me when we have conversations around, well, this pot of money is this and this is this because when you even cited uh, the 186 unit or the uh, however many units that have been contributing to fulfillment of the Alliance, 186 of those units came as a result of Project Home Key and some of the acquisitions. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it should be very linear in terms of how we see uh, how the dollars, what, what source of revenue is helping to fulfill the various obligations. So I just want to stick purely on uh, on, on uh, some of this right Council now. Council member, can I clarify though on the sure. home key? We put in 32 million from the HEA funds from the 250 million to leverage the home key funds and we work closely with everyone to make sure that happens. So I mean, I just want to make clear. Okay, I, like I said, it's for, for me, it's about as clear yeah. as mud. So yeah. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, again, perhaps how we can uh, do a better job of reporting these things out. 
Much of that also comes by not uh, missing three previous opportunities to have these reports and these engagements so that we could perhaps have better clarity as we're in the process of doing it. Because here we are getting ready, uh, fast-tracked, a conversation to replenish uh, all the resources that have been expended. Uh, we just learned just on Friday how much it's costing us uh, and it's still, you know, for all the money that we're expending uh, with respect to Inside Safe, it ha it's not advancing the obligations that we have to meet with, to meet the uh, compliance uh, goals and targets associated with the Alliance uh, settlement. That said, um, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can, Madam Chair, because I know, I'm sure Mr. Blumenfield also has uh, some questions. Ms. Rodriguez, but if I could just interrupt for just one minute. Um, mm -hmm. I just did want to say that I have put in a request with the council president to have the um, homeless emergency declaration presentation and the alliance settlement be heard together at the full council. It's something that I did discuss with him. So I, okay. I hear you and I think that's a great idea. I've already been talking to him about it, but precisely because some of the people who are making the decision on the budget committee are not here in this committee listening to what's happening and it's such a big part of our budget. So I appreciate that input um, and hope that it can happen in the broader committee, uh, council meeting as well. Well, thank you. And, and I'll tell you the other reason why it's really important because I uh, unfortunately had to discover that there was a meeting that was happening today with respect to uh, numbers that we needed to fulfill associated with compliance that were transmitted uh, without the express consent or vetting from this council. And it was a uh, representative from the mayor's office was there, from the CAO and the city attorney's office, but none of these conversations had transpired with any member, well, actually they suggested that perhaps a couple of members of the council had been vetted, but uh, these are actions and commitments that this council is obligated to fulfill. And so I don't appreciate finding out uh, that there's it, what feels like gaming of, uh, of uh, you know, commitments that are being made by council district uh, being made in absence of council consent. And as I said, without me showing up, there would have been zero council representation at that meeting. I just showed up. So uh, that's a really big problem and it's a red flag for me. So I'm just, I'm, and I'm communicating this because to start, you opened with, we. We need to work together. I couldn't agree more. We're absolutely looking to work together. In fact, there's a great deal of work that many of the members of this council have been engaged in prior to a 2022 election. And we have a lot of lessons learned, good lessons, bad lessons. And we're not trying to repeat the ones that we know have failed. And so my frustration is that I've had a lot of circumstances. Uh, for example, the recent uh, uh, the recent uh, exercise, as, as this council has been working through the process on an RV, uh, RV to home program, which of course, as everyone knows, was piloted in my district. We've done very well uh, with over uh, 65 RVs, nearly 100 people placed in our own operation. We've done all that, only to find after my staff in good faith had conversations with the mayor's team, saw a week later, a couple weeks later, uh, because conversations ceased, and we see a week later an operation on Forest Lawn Drive, which we, we, we have no means of tracking what the outcomes were associated with that. In fact, we know that only 20 RVs were towed. My understanding, based on LAPD reports, were that there were 100 RVs there. And as I said to uh, Ms. Uh, Ramirez Castro, I said, she said it wasn't 100. I said, okay, let's call it 50. If you're telling me that only 20 RVs were towed, that tells me that there's 30 unaccounted for and we have no idea what the outcomes and circumstances are with those operations, but that was part of Inside Safe. And so I, I raise all of this because, to your point, there are multiple buckets and efforts that are happening, whether it's LASA, whether it's uh, council directed, but we're standing up new efforts under the guise of emergency, which yes, everyone agrees, it is an emergency but we have to be efficient, we have to meet our obligations per the Alliance case so that we don't fall into a circumstance where we're then having to pay penalties and reducing more of our resources to have to pay out because we're failing to meet the obligations that we had contractually obligated ourselves to 
long before anyone was here. We don't need to relitigate that. We need to do the work. And so I want to make sure that we are, in fact, all consistently working together on this because that has not yet been the experience. And so the one thing I will, I, I want to just dig in on a little bit uh, is on the, um, you know, on the number of beds, on the, in, on the uh, you know, we discovered the cost associated with the number of beds that are contractually obligated. Right, or that, that have been uh, secured through Inside Safe with the resources. We already know we figured out $115.49 a room per room uh, per night, uh, which is roughly $34.65, didn't include the cost of services. Um, do we know what the cost of services are for those, for those rooms that are being serviced under Inside Safe? Uh, yes, we do. Our updated service provider contract through LASA allows a daily, daily bed rate of up to 110 a person. This includes updated participant agreement and intake instructions, greatly expanded monitoring and oversight regulations, funding for case managers and newly defined case management practices, defined parameters around the operator's responsibility for linking clients to county benefits and development of health and behavioral care coordination improved protocol regarding the reporting of incidents, exits, and deaths, coverage for storage expenses as needed for placements and exits, documentation of meal delivery and increased focus on hot meals. So we've um, is that a, a, Is that a fixed cost from LASA? At I believe it's a fixed at, cost. So the service providers, uh, everyone's getting a fixed number on that? I'm gonna, I wanna just look back at our team and make sure I'm saying this correctly. It's, yeah. up to what? It's, it's an up to amount. I think they can bill up to the 100 Okay. So we have an up to amount, but we, so we don't even know that each service provider is consistently per, char, uh, okay, so then, so what, what we'd like to see, what I'd like to see, and I know that's part of the, re, uh, the amendment that I requested in terms of ascertaining, we know based on each service provider what, uh, essentially what the average cost is, but we should know, and it should be consistent across the board, we should know what that is, and it should be fixed. And so at $110 on top of the 115, if you're telling me an average, you're now talking about roughly $7,000 a month per room, correct? For services, because we're basically almost doubling. You're welcome to come to the table. And yeah. Ms. Rodriguez, I also want to make sure we allow Mr. Blumenfield no, some questions. I, yes, Thank no, you. I'm trying to, sure. trying to tighten it up, Bob. Well, I'll, I'll go for it. Okay. I mean, I'm the 110 service charge is an up to amount. LASA can bill up to that amount, mm -hmm. and it has just been put in place as of January 1st. So I cannot. So we don't even know what we were paying prior to? We were paying considerably less than that, but not getting the level of service that, that we require. So this is, this is what happens. OK, we have models that have already been in place, but when we stand up new ways of doing it, we get charged more. Um, again, what it still does is it doesn't provide any level of consistency across the board between what's operating independently in, uh, you know, from the city effort versus what LASA is doing. It's very, it's very messy. It's very muddled and it's very expensive. And so those are some of the concerns. That's what I'm looking back for that reporting back, frankly, more consistently so that we can, uh, so that we can see that uh, in real time to know what's working and at what cost is it actually working, if it's working at all. Um, in terms of the, because again, we also know that the transition, uh, or at least from what I've heard from news reports, uh, the transition of those that have been placed into, in through uh, Inside Safe, uh, there's been a minimal number of uh, permanent placement or permanent resolution, whether it's reunification, whatever the circumstances are. So with the 1,600 roughly individuals uh, where, that have been aided, my question is, we've seen what happened at the LA Grand, and it continues to be uh, continued and extended to keep these individuals there. My question is, through this process, essentially what you're forcing the hand of this council to do, it's kind of, it's kind of like with the, the situation with the, uh, with the Skid Row Housing Trust. You're obligating us in future budget cycles to have to allocate and program dollars to sustain this, because if we don't, people are going to be displaced. 
And so I say that because that's a very important budget issue that everyone needs to remember is that this wasn't a one-time deal. This is a noose that says we're, we're, we're tied to this thing because we don't have an exit strategy and we did nothing to fulfill our alliance obligation. This is money squandered in my opinion if it doesn't have these sustained outcomes. And so, you know, again, there's not a question in it because it's, this is unfortunately what I'm seeing and what you're certainly exposing in this, in this process is that we are gonna be stuck with these very expensive rooms because there wasn't a good negotiation up front. There was no council oversight. It was all, it was all uh, handled by uh, the former chief. And so now we're stuck because what are we gonna do with these individuals that have been placed that I, we have no sense of knowing whether these individuals are on track for permanent placement or permanent resolution for their housing. And so what is gonna be that continued cost to not just sustain the room, but the services? It makes it almost impossible for us to do more. And it doesn't really, it doesn't really engender a lot of faith in terms of what the cost is gonna be for what we're, out, what we're getting in output. And I wanna make sure that what we're doing is not putting ourselves, we continue to put ourselves in this situation. Like I said, today, this morning was a wake up call. That there are a lot of actions and conversations being had absent this council's consent. And that's a really big problem for me. But on top of it, to add insult to injury, we are obligating the future budgets in a time when we're seeing the state budget and the economy. We're headed towards a fiscal cliff. And so the sustaining of it, there needs to be some really deeper thinking about what's working and some honest conversations about it because thank, thank we want to work together so that we don't fail. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. I think that point is very, very well taken and especially given that we are looking at a very steep um, gap in the budget based on our last FSR, uh, I think this is gonna be a fairly important issue. I don't think there was an answer required, so I'm gonna move it over to Councilmember Blumenfield just so we can move things along. Great, no, and, and I really appreciate the comments, Ms. Rodriguez, and, and second your amendment uh, for sure. And a couple of questions, but, but one just to build on, on the, the different rates with Inside Safe. Are we doing the same for the other interim sites? Uh, how, how are we doing the comparison of, of not just the rates, but the services that are offered? Because if we want to have a consistent approach citywide, we need to be thinking not just of the inside safe, because uh, it's the same service providers uh, for all the other sites, but you know, why are they treated differently at the inside safe location versus the tiny homes and all the rest? I mean, one thing I'll say is we do actually hope this expanded level of service, which we do know costs more, but it's service and care, and we do want to see it expanded citywide because we want to make sure that our unhoused Angelinos receive the services that they need, um, and, and they're really critical. And we also know that it's important, and we know you all hear from service providers that they can't um, keep workers or pay their workers enough um, and make sure they're properly compensated. So we think these expanded services are critical, but also hearing from our service providers that they're being paid what they need to sustain um, continues. I'm not, I, can you answer If, if I could, others? could I ask a question with that? Yeah. One of, the, one of the, que the challenges that I have with um, that uh, assertion is only that there have been models of service provision across the entire city that have been operating in various council districts. Some of them have already been very successful and they don't cost as much as the Inside Safe program. Um, some of them have been very good at moving people more quickly into permanent housing. Some of them have been very good at retention. I know that you compared an average versus what Inside Safe is doing in terms of retention. I think individual sites look very, very different and have very, very different levels of services and oversight by the council already. And so I just wanna say that Yes, of course, we all want the highest level of services being provided at every site. There's no doubt about that. But the question is, some of these other sites are maybe doing it much more economically, maybe doing it just as effectively, may have models that are not being considered right now. And I just feel like we're missing an opportunity to, to really you know, uh, compare and understand how we move forward on this 
because um, we're not kind of engaging on those discussions. So before we move something citywide, I think we also need to look at what we have been doing. Sorry, Councilmember Bloomfield, I just wanted to add to No, it's a, it's, it's a very good point, and I mean, it, it all fits together, and, and it's all related. I mean, the same points about about um, inside safe not counting toward the alliance. We don't want to increase our liability and obligation with limited resources. And, and related to all that, um, you know, I was looking at the presentation and, uh, you know, and, and th this idea of a citywide approach, it's, it, it makes sense, of course, globally, but what it, you know, when you actually get beyond the, the, the words, it's not very clear what we're asking for. In some ways, a citywide approach would mean to me city and mayor as one, not, you know, I, I look at this, this document and I see, you know, these little boxes that say mayor's initiative, like the circle program and the RV program, which are clearly things that the council is very engaged in, I don't really find it useful to to separate it that way. That doesn't feel citywide. That feels city versus, you know, mayor versus council. Um, I just clarify, I think we were just trying to make clear what's being paid for by the HEA. So I, I get good note on the graphic. We can yeah. fix, always can fix graphics. We were just trying to get clearer for you all how what's in the HEA compares to. And I don't think street medicine or circle are being paid for by the HEA. So, like we funded street medicine. Yeah. Our, our office oversees the street medicine based on the but It's UHRC, not funded through the HEA. But we don't fund it. No, the, the purple highlight is what we fund. If it has the little flag, that just means part of it is overseen by our office. And, and at the end of the day, it's all artificial. It's all, it's, the mayor doesn't do it. The council doesn't do it. It's the taxpayer that does it. We are the stewards of that. We are all together. We're all in this together. We want to lock arms and all be together. So it's sort of, it's a little maddening sometimes with all of the different distinctions uh, because none of that gets people housed. You know, we need to focus on getting people housed. And, and similarly looking at the, and, and I don't mean to be taking issue with the graphics or something, but it, I'm raising this because it's coming up also in the Alliance case. This, I, you know, there, the Alliance case, as Ms. Rodriguez mentioned, needs to be, it can't be universally, you know, unilaterally changed. It needs to be with this, the, the, this council engaged. And, you know, when I look at this thing saying fragmented, inequitable approach, I'm not sure what this inequity, you know, nobody wants inequity, but I don't know what it really means in this, in this context. And I get a little concerned um, sometimes about the way that it's presented in terms of as, in some ways, some of this is euphemisms for removing the council engagement mm -hmm. or the council uh, control over it. And I know there's a lot of people involved in the mayor's office and different people have different ideas of how that goes. But that's a concern because we all made real obligations uh, throughout the process with, with Judge Carter and we, have, we, made, we made commitments to our communities about what we would make sure happens in our district. So yes, citywide makes a lot of sense, but we have to be careful that this isn't at the expense of the initiatives that are taken on a local level. You know, and local, a district, as we all know, and I don't need to remind us, but is bigger than most cities, uh, you know, across the country, and certainly in Los Angeles, the district is bigger than every, you know, all cities in Los Angeles except for Long Beach. Uh, so, and these are all cities that have unique approaches. So, I'm kind of just putting a marker in that because it's, it's a concern. I don't want to delve too, too deeply in it, but I didn't want to just let it go either because I do have concerns over that. Um, let me get, dive down a little bit more uh, specific questions. The, uh, the data. Um, we're seeing some improvements from LASA on inside safe data. How, how do we get the same level of attention and reporting from LASA on data for the other efforts outside of inside safe? And they did present their updated data the last time, um, which I think does give council districts and the city that level of detail. Some, le some level of detail. I, I'm still, I still have issues. I mean, the uh, city provided additional funding for data staff at LASA with 13 positions, yeah, no. all that. But we're still not getting the data that we need. Uh, and, and we're not getting it regularly supplied to our council offices either. And, and the data that we're getting is not, um, is often not the, the real questions that we want to answer. You know, when we come across someone, who, who are they? What, what, what have, you know, what is their, 
situation, what have they been offered services uh, before, you know, those kinds of things, which, which we're, we're still not getting. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, good morning, or sorry, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Calvin Sung. I'm the Housing and Homelessness Data Director in the Mayor's Office. Um, I think the many issues you run into, we run into uh, as well. And uh, with new leadership at LASA, that's helped us actually break down some of these issues and bottlenecks in terms of data, real time, uh, synchronization of this data, uh, as, and to better understand what's going on. Um, there's also, you know, unfortunately, a county portion to this data that we're working towards to better uh, bring that data into LASA or synchronize that data so that we can better understand all these different pieces that come to play. Um, but I think we are definitely uh, working towards uh, merging a lot of the data sets that everyone is requesting to better streamline the request that data uh, that LASA gets from us as a city. Uh, that way we can better be on the same page in terms of metrics and what performances we want to reach to. Right. And, and that needs to be things like how many people in the district have been served. Uh, access to the case management data, how many beds are open, how many are filled. Uh, you know, if we want to get throughput, we need to have that kind of information, and that's something that's still, despite years of talking about this, it's still, it's still a big frustration. Um, you know, we talked about the RV engagement, but the RV site, is, as we mentioned, is listed as inside safe, but that's obviously more than inside safe. Um, the rental assistance pro uh, problem solving funding is needed to enhance services offered by Circle. What resources are needed to enhance the services offered by the Circle teams themselves? Sorry, can you say that again? So how much rental assistance and or problem solving funding is needed to enhance the services that are offered by Circle? By Circle? By Circle. Yeah. Okay, but, he's, he's but it, it does, I mean, it's a homelessness response program yeah. that offers, it, when they're not on a proactive call, they are actually doing outreach uh, regularly. They deal exclusively with unhoused residents and they are, um, they are providing case management services. So I think that's why Councilmember Blumenfield was asking the question and I think for us on this committee, we've always considered Circle to be very much a part of our homelessness response um, because they've, they've acted as that in our districts. And, and with the data, we've got to integrate the data from Circle with the rest of the homeless data that the city's tracking. Otherwise, we're, it's not complete. Uh, there is work towards that um, within the mayor's office and um, to try to bring some of that data into a way where we can integrate it with the efforts that we're doing. Uh, it's multi, it's, uh, it's not something that will happen tomorrow, but it is something that is on our um, kind of agenda in terms of integrating the data that we do have between different um, homelessness programs. Because right. we're gonna enhance the services for Circle if we need to, we need to figure that out. And how else are we gonna do that without getting that data? Um, and Circle does use HMIS. Yes. Um, so that so end of LASA It's will part of the existing data stream. Correct. Um, so that data in terms of the individual profiles, those are making it to um, LASA and um, in terms of that integration. So we can come up with more of a citywide dashboard in terms of maybe specific programs, Inside Safe Circle and others um, that all get housed into HMIS um, and figure out exactly in terms of city involved programs, what is that outreach in terms of the overall uh, outreach that is happening across the city by LASA. Okay. I know I'm jumping around, but the, you know, we were talking before about the service provider scope of required services, the SRS, and you mentioned all these great things, um, which we also want to see in the interim sites, but you, you also mentioned storage, and I'm interested in that because I've been trying to do that in my district in a variety of ways. How does that actually work? Do you let, uh, are private storage lockers rented? Or what's the process there? Because we've done a pilot on storage. We've done a whole bunch of things on storage. And this is another approach. Exactly. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Lee Hoffman Kip, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives. Thank you for your time. Um, 
So storage, it's a new LASA requirement for the 30 days of storage when folks exit interim housing programs. So our team looked at ways that we could offset coordinating that through a central contract. And so we're doing that um, with economies of scale. And so we'll be kicking that off in this first quarter. We're so happy to share the contractor and all of Yeah, I'd love to see how that, that you know, we've done, and to, to consult with you guys on that, because we've, we've done a number of storage pilots where we had a nonprofit group where, we, you know, obviously Crystalis has its big program, but we've also tried to do it as one-offs with, um, you know, with private storage operations. It's somebody that's already got a city contract, so happy to share with your team. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll take that offline then. And then uh, regarding the time-limited subsidies, separate question. H how much has the city committed to time-limited subsidies? How many time-limited subsidy slots uh, is the city actually funding? And does that include the $18 million for rental assistance for Inside Safe? So the $18 million is for time-limited subsidies. We wanted to make sure we were leveraging all of the county resources first. And so we've been waiting to hear back from providers who have been utilizing county TLS slots. And we're now going to create plans with each provider to make them whole to add those 400 slots to their so, it, so it's in addition to the the eighteen million is four hundred slots, two year slots. Four hundred slots, okay. And and what's the policy for how the time limited slots are distributed? So that's what the provider, right? So in terms of when they do the case management, the housing navigation piece, and then the TLS piece, connecting all of that as a continuum of care. When a person, so loss is shifting, not to speak for them. But in terms of strategy-wise, shifting to when they assign the TLS slots, waiting until housing navigation has done the work of finding the housing, as opposed to assigning the TLS slot further up in the process of matching with case management. So I'm still confused. So how, how is it actually distributed? Who decides it and how much is the funding outside of Inside Safe, or is it all within Inside Safe? So the 18 million is 400 slots. The idea was that we attach them to folks in Inside Safe to increase throughput from interim to permanent through the existing eight provider, nine providers that we have in our portfolio. Right, and there's more dollars for time limited subsidy outside of the 18 million. No, that is, that line item is the 400. We were saying that we've been we have not expended those yet because the county at the start of Inside Safe gave the providers the authority to use underspend from county. So in an effort to leverage existing county resources before putting in more city resources, the providers have been doing that, and now we're making a plan for what the providers need. Um, many of them, having used those slots, really need these slots because they used county, right? Treating all of the participants in their portfolios with the services that they need. The providers are, they need those slots now. Right, and are those eight, is that eighteen million from inside from the HEA account, or that's this that's what the you guys allocated that? Uh, I'm confused. Yeah. Exactly. Because th there was a city allocation for time limited subsidies. The half. Uh huh. Yeah. That's so, not just for inside safe, though. Right. That we are speaking to of the two hundred fifty million. There's an $18 million line item for 400 TLS slots. For what? Uh, $18 million line item for 400 TLS slots. Separate and additional to the council's separate investment in TLS. So, the, so how, much is, how much separate is the time-limited subsidy outside of the inside safe? So the half funding that is um, being given, um, that was approved from the city, it, it is not for inside safe. It is used for other, um, you know, existing liabilities that we're carrying over from previous fiscal year. Um, so currently, if I understand correctly, the, um, the time limited subsidies that are currently being used for inside safe participants are being leveraged from county funding. And as those um, leveraged resources are dwindling, then they will use or um, utilize that 18 million line item that's within the HEA budget. Right. So there's 18 million within Inside Safe. There's X amount 
Is there another 18 million outside of inside safe being used for time limited subsidies? Yeah. There, there, there is an amount for time limited subsidy in the budget. I don't recall the number off my hand. I believe it was funded by some of our HAP funds, but that is separate from. The That's budget. above and beyond the 18 million. That is correct, sir. Okay, but we do, but the amount we don't know. I'm guessing it's like five million or something. But charted. what's that? I just don't recall sitting here since there's a lot of things funded in that right. no, it's a very distinct Right. Don't expect anybody to have all these numbers on yeah. the top of their head. I'm just trying to under, understand how it all fits together and how the policy is, is different in terms of how we, how we use those in those time limited subsidies. Is it the same policy for the inside safe time limited subsidy? Is it a different policy in terms of how they get distributed? Because that's also a bit of a black box um, in terms of how how that works. And part of it's because, you know, you all get to spend a lot of time on, on this. We're spending time on a million different things. And so trying to peer into this is, is not always so easy. And I still don't understand how the distributions for time limited subsidies, you know, what policies that is under and how that works. But we'll bring that back. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, well, I, that was a, a number of questions that I think summarized. Uh, oh, you have one more? Okay. Just trying to keep care. Um, okay, I just want to make sure. So I know that you have to leave pretty soon. We have a member, two members out because of illness and other obligations. So, which means we will have to wrap up at five. We have a few items. And Madam Chair, on, on, on five and seven, I know I called them special, but I will, I'll ask my questions offline, so I'm happy to approve them as is. And, okay, and so we can do that afterwards. And then I just want to, just in terms of time, I just want to make sure that we are able to, um, I know there's people who are very interested in hearing the LA Grand Demobilization. We don't need a quorum here for, to do that, but you know, I just want to make sure we hear it, because I think it's really important. Okay, so with that, one more question um, from quick. Councilmember Rodriguez. So uh, you have here on your list an RV safe parking pilot listed on this uh, effort. Uh, as I shared with uh, the new chief, uh, who was unaware that we actually piloted RV safe parking in my district back in 2018, and it doesn't work because it uh, actually causes more challenges for the service providers. They can't move them off the lot and they become a bigger problem. So my question is, where are you targeting this? It, this goes back to uh, the missing link on uh, working that we need to work together. Uh, because again, I don't like to learn the same lessons that we learned that failed uh, at great expense and we test these things so we figure out what works and we move forward with what works and so that we could have some cost constraints because there's a lot of money uh, invested in this. So my question is, where are you launching this RV safe pi parking pilot and where, uh, where, how much is being expended to it? Uh, what, what is the plan? So we, this is a newer effort um, that the mayor is interested in having the team pursue. So right now they've been researching costs. There is not a location in place and we do have a task force, including with your team that's been really active. Um, to work with to figure out lessons learned, what has worked, what has worked in other cities. So our team is doing some research and we'll bring it back through the task force. We're at this moment, there isn't a budget or a location. Okay, so then going back to, uh, you know, again, looking at historically what's worked, what's been deployed and all of that. How have you measured, what has been your process to measure uh, encampment resolution costs associated with other programs versus what it's costing with Insight Safe? How has, what, what process of evaluation has, whether it's LASA, whether it's LA Family Housing, whatever it is, because we've had, we've got multiple people doing the same thing. It's all very duplicative. How have you evaluated and identified efficiencies or what the costs are associated with this effort versus any other? Are you talking about, you're talking about RVs? No, I'm talking about Inside Safe. I'm talking about this process yeah. of outreach, placement, all yeah. of these things. How, you know, there has been, through roadmaps, we had an effort uh, and, and did placements and did encampment resolutions. Uh, you know, I can tell you what it cost us to do Paxton and Bradley, where it all first started for the large scale encampments. So, 
uh, what due diligence has the office done to evaluate efficiencies that perhaps whether it's been done by uh, this new effort or because uh, you know you just said oh we're, we're doing the research well that hasn't happened when inside safe was brought online but we're learning some very hard lessons now as a result of again not starting first by doing the research so my question is how now learning that okay these costs we're seeing the costs are uh, you know ex excessive uh, it doesn't feel like a lot of efficiencies and so my question is what process have, has the office engaged in to evaluate perhaps how to refine or change what you're doing because it's clearly very expensive in comparison to what's happening with other efforts and how is that being moderated? Well, I think one of the things we're showing is um, the retention rates and I think that's important one way to, to look at it in terms of people staying in so we can get them the services they need and get them moved. I think the next year, a big focus, and again, I think we share this with you all, is working on the throughput since we have units opening up and moving people in. So I think that's an important um, outcome to look at is our ability to increase throughput. So when you that say for the next year, that automatically assumes that this council is going to re-up an additional allocation on top of the current allocation uh, that was committed for this one-time funding that was allocated. Well, I'm going to let Lee speak to this, but I believe like a number of the occupancy agreements that are in place and reflected in the budget are two years. So we've been able to, to stretch the ability to keep folks in, and we have a very focused commitment on the throughput and working with LASA, Hathlin, LHD, and we actually in the next few weeks want to come sit down with you all because working hard to really focus in on what is and isn't working for throughput, which we think is a really critical um, thing to, to look at in terms of outcomes is moving people from interim to permanent um, and getting more people moved into permanent housing and, and out of the motels. Would you like me to share some more of the history about the cost basis? Yeah, I, I think I just I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna step in here and yeah. just clarify yeah. the question again because I think it, we don't have that answer today so I think it's really important for us to be moving forward. The question as I understand it is we have years of history mm -hmm. in terms of interventions in the city on addressing homelessness, including encampment resolution efforts across council districts. We now have a year of operations under Inside Safe, and before we are continuing to commit more funding to all of these efforts, how are we evaluating across these different interventions to see what is the most cost effective and just plain effective way of intervening in homelessness in LA before we make further decisions on that. I don't think we are doing that yet. Doesn't seem like we're doing that even as through the process of, uh, of, 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 of building out Inside Safe. And I would just add to that question, which I think is a very good one. Given that we have the obligations under the Alliance Settlement and we have such high services costs here, the Alliance Settlement actually provides mandates that the county provide funding mm -hmm. for services. It's part of the settlement. So that $10 million that we've been paying, we, you know, going forward and potentially could have been retroactive if the motels had been long-term leases Contest. or whatever, right. that we could have actually had that paid by the county. And maybe some of those motels can be, depending on how they're, they're operating. But I think this question of how do you evaluate between different interventions and how do you figure out what model is the best and most effective and most cost effective way to move forward and how do we ensure that we're getting every dollar that we deserve from the Alliance Settlement I think is going to be very, very important, especially as we move into a very bleak fiscal year. Um, and I think you can hear from everyone on this committee that this is a, a, a key concern for us. Um, as we move forward. So I, I, well, I do want to say, you know, I always like to mark progress, halting um, as it can feel in the homelessness sector. Um, I have been grateful for renewed efforts from LASA on bringing better data to the table. I know we're not where we want to be yet, but I'm grateful for their work on this. And I am grateful for this document and for this presentation, which actually moves us further along in the conversation related to Inside Safe and the mayor's office's work than we had in the past, and really grateful that I feel like we had much 
deeper answers and much greater discussion in this meeting than we have had in the past with, with the mayor's office. So thank you for that. I think I wish this has happened six months ago rather than now, but I'm really looking forward to ensuring that this urgency and this energy, this shared vision for improvement can be implemented, and, I, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with all of you on that. So thank you so much, um, and thank you to my committee members for great questions, and we look forward to partnering with you on uh, really addressing this issue, locking arms. <laughs> thank you. Do we need to do anything on this? Um, uh, yes, Madam Chair. With the okay of Councilmember Blumenfield, we could vote on items 5, 7, 16, and 18, with 5 as approved, 7 as amended, and 16 and 18 as noted and filed, if you would like. That's fine with me. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Absent. Three ayes, and these items are approved, with 7 as amended, and 16 and 18 noted and filed. Um, and I just, be, before we lose quorum, I want to make sure that we quickly um, take on item 17. This is the augmented winter, winter shelter report from Lhasa, and the reason why I'm asking that we hear it is because we have potentially some tricky weather situations coming up, and I want to make sure that Lhasa is uh, given the authority to be able to move forward uh, on this. This was something that we requested of them after Hurricane Hillary, um, and they came, and this is the process that they've put forward, so I want to, is, is, if it's all right with you, we'll just hear that. Um, so, you, if you want to read that item into the record. Yes, Madam Chair. Item number 17 is a Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority report relative to the Inclement Weather Shelter Program. Great. Thank you very much. And I don't know, um, Council Members, um, I read through this report. I found it fairly straightforward, uh, but I don't know if you had additional questions. And I did just want to say thank you to LASA for being responsive to this committee's requests for greater planning and foresight onto inclement weather planning here in, in inclement weather response here in the city. Um, and I just wanted to open the floor in case my colleagues had questions on this issue. Let me just real quick. Uh, sure, Councilmember Bloomfield, uh, go ahead. How are we gonna be notified of the results of the RFP and, and how can we find out which locations are gonna be made available? So uh, the RFP, will uh, we are bringing it to our commission uh, for approval uh, next week, I believe. Um, and uh, once those, uh, once uh, agencies have the opportunity to respond, those will go back to our commission for approval. Uh, the goal of the RFP is actually to um, allow us to have a bench of providers that could uh, stand up services at uh, a variety of sites. Um, there will not be immediate uh, commitments of funding to these agencies. It's uh, similar to Inside Safe, uh, where we want to have a bench of providers that have uh, stood up and said, that they're interested and willing to uh, staff into emergency shelters uh, as we respond to climate and weather-related emergencies. Uh, we are also requesting um, responses to this uh, RFP that would include uh, the provision of additional sites. Um, so we'd be glad to bring back the results of, uh, of the entire RFP to a presentation at this committee if, uh, if, that would, if you all would be interested. Um, but they will also be published uh, and discussed at our uh, commission meeting. Great, glad there's gonna be a report back. And, and will this also include like uh, smoke issues or extreme heat and? So the, the goal of the, uh, the year round and climate weather shelter program is to be able to allow us to, uh, to respond to any uh, climate related emergency, whether that's extreme heat, uh, that's fire danger and need to evacuate folks from fire or that um, the air quality conditions are so poor that we wanna make sure that folks can get indoors. Um, any of any of those uh, it's it's called out in the report but specifically uh, we have uh, specific activation re uh, criteria related to excessive heat excessive Great. cold excessive rain wildfires thank you landslides yeah. etc okay. okay. uh, and if I, if I may super quick sure uh, to your comment uh, at the beginning councilmember Rahman for this weekend we are in uh, the um, uh, winter shelter season right. so we already have authorization for response for this uh, the program that we're reporting on would allow us to have that um, authorization March. outside of the yes. uh, winter shelter season. I was saying um, really that our uh, inclement weather program, um, uh, I think we are all realizing that there's emergencies beyond the winter that, that, 
that we need to be responding to. And I know that there's an RFP process here, so we just want to make sure that it was timely. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear yeah. that we have, Great. have what we need to be able to respond this weekend. Great. Okay. Uh, barring any other questions, I would uh, recommend that we approve this item. Oh, note and file. Councilmember Brahmi. Yes. Councilmember Bloomingfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee, absent. Three ayes, and this item is noted and filed. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> let us move on to item. Yeah, so let's let's have item one, which is the LA Grand uh, demobilization. I know we had a number of members here in the audience who are waiting for this, and um, some other council office staff. Back, to, welcome back. <laughs> uh, for the record, Madam Chair, item number one is our verbal reports from the Mayor, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, and other needed departments on the demobilization plan that ensures all residents continue on their housing solution path. So this, you know, basically this came out as a result of an amendment um, to the 21st roadmap report. And we did this when the other project room key sites were demobilizing. Uh, LASA was coming to the homelessness committee, it was the HMP committee at that time, to present updates on, on demobilization of all of our room key sites. And so, um, so I'm happy to continue hearing this. I noticed that only LASA is at the table. Uh, this particular item asks for a group of people, but maybe you could speak to what, what's happening there and then we can, we can ask any uh, additional questions. Uh, gladly, just given uh, time, I'll be as brief as possible. Um, glad to take questions though. So uh, LASA um, has begun work on our demobilization plan in concert with Weingart, the um, agency that operates the services at uh, the Grand. Um, and in co collaboration with the mayor's office. Um, we are currently there are uh, approximately 430, I believe it's 438 residents at the Grand as of today. Um, there will be the opportunity uh, to move uh, approximately 300 uh, individuals to the Mayfair um, as the Mayfair opens. And so we are looking at approximately 136 participants uh, at the Grand that we will need to find alternative demobilization plans for. Uh, so we are working, as I said, actively with the Weingart uh, in uh, ensuring that we have uh, accurate accounting of resources that have been allocated already to those 136 individuals. Uh, our expectation uh, of Weingart and our LASA staff is that uh, participants will be offered uh, at least three opportunities uh, for interim house, alternative interim housing placements uh, during this time period, but our primary focus is on permanent housing placements as part of the demobilization. We, this plan mirrors uh, the, the demobilization plan that we had, had in place for the grant originally. Fortunately, uh, this time we have far fewer individuals that we are searching for um, placements for, uh, given that, uh, as I said, uh, 302 of the current uh, residents at the grant are part of the encampment resolution project um, that is centered on Skid Row and uh, our uh, receiving additional services through the Department of Health Services and will be able to be housed at the Mayfair as part of that project. And what happens if the Mayfair doesn't open on time? So we're working with the Mayor's Office and DHS on alternative plans. Um, I, I would uh, uh, defer to the Mayor's Office in terms of timing around the Mayfair, um, but based on what we know to be the timeline, we are confident that we will be able to move individuals uh, to the Mayfair in a timely fashion to be able to exit the Grand by June 30th. Okay, and I don't know if the Mayor's office is here, still here to speak to the expected timelines at the Mayfair. Welcome back. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Talk, Deputy Mayor of Housing. Yeah, I think we reported at the December committee May 1st, and that is still the date that is anticipated for the Mayfair. And uh, how will you, uh, you know, just how do you, how will you know if you need more time at the Mayfair? When, by there when are, will you know? I mean, there are weekly calls on progress. So at this moment, again, there has been no indication that there's issue. In fact, I, I can't speak, Mia, Mia Jackson isn't here, who goes to the calls every week. But um, my understanding is most of the work will be done by mid-April. And it's just some of the more tenant improvements for kind of the service area spaces. But the rooms are going to even be done sooner. So at this point, we don't have any 
particular reason to, to think that data is going to be off. But okay. we again, weekly calls, and then often there's daily calls for troubleshooting going on. So a lot of tracking. Okay. Great. Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there was testimony provided that there uh, had been multiple reports to the mayor's office about the circumstances, the public safety threats, uh, based on the negligence of the operator that was that is currently in place. Uh, that I believe is also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, also contracted perhaps to provide the services at Mayfair. Is that accurate? What's Wine accurate Guard? is that WineGuard is the same service provider. That is not my understanding what's accurate about reports. We have had, re and I don't have notes in front of me, sorry, I just ran up to the table, but there have been, there were regular meetings um, with the school, and particularly when the service provider switched over, it had been a t prior service provider, and then the summer switched over to WineGuard. Um, there had been almost no calls with issues and any issues that have been brought to attention. We were having weekly meetings. Um, the, the school itself stopped attending those weekly meetings in August. Um, or no, sorry, they, they started, again, I don't have, sorry, I didn't have my notes in front of me on this, but there has been regular communication with the school and with Weingarten have not really been any issues reported um, that we're aware of prior. Okay, um, I, you know, I, it was odd to me that the principal, uh, when he provided testimony, uh, was in tears as well as all the administration that was there that said that they had been threatened by the former chief uh, not to communicate with the office anymore because it was uh, a problem. So uh, again, I just, you know, I can only, I, talking to the constituent that is being impacted by it, uh, and so, you know, there's always three sides to a story. I know that, but I just, I'm, I'm curious if there have been uh, subsequent public safety related concerns that have been uh, reported at the site and you're saying no everything to great. my knowledge no everything's fantastic there interesting okay so I don't think those were my words council member I okay. said to my no I mean no. well there's no other report so it must be flawless so we will I, I need to take a visit um, so uh, I, I'd actually like to request that given some of what had already been addressed by uh, by these individuals uh, I'd like to get uh, updates from the CAO, the mayor's office, and relevant departments regarding the safety concerns linked to the LA Grand Hotel um, to be s specifically so that we can address it because, I mean, I'm now compelled to go visit myself uh, since you're, uh, you know, I'll take you at your word that there's no additional reports, but that's not what I'm hearing uh, from the, uh, from the teary-eyed constituents that were affected by it. So it doesn't jive, so now I gotta go check it out. Sure. So we're happy um, to connect you with Weingart. We've actually done terrific. several tours for um, folks um, that are in, in and around the Mayfair and community stakeholders. So we're okay. happy to coordinate that. Terrific, that'll be awesome. So I'd like to, I'd like to get uh, an update on, on what that actually is, because you know, the, the impacts to these young people, it's irrefutable. Yes. So I wanna make sure that we're looking at everything because if the same operator is in place, I don't want to make sure that we're moving the problem uh, from this location to the next. So maybe for the next meeting, if we can have a specific um, reference to that issue in advance, I think that would be great. Yep. Um, and then uh, back to Lhasa, I just wanted to ask, how quickly will the demobilization plan for the 136 individuals start? So uh, we are uh, finalizing those plans now. We, uh, under our participant agreement, we. Uh, we'll be giving tenants, uh, the, the residents at the, the shelter, a 30-day notice, uh, and those will begin by the end of the month. Uh, so movement will begin uh, 30 days after that. Okay. The what will event begin 30 days after that? Uh, movement of, of individuals uh, to alternate sites. Uh, so bit, bit in that 30-day period, you'll be doing the three visits to the other locations or offering the three other alternatives? Correct. Okay. Okay, great. And last time, when this process was happening for room key sites, we had the opportunity to have uh, at least a PowerPoint slide um, along with kind of weekly updates on how many people were moving. So as soon as, I think as soon as the process has started, we'd like to get that same level of transparency for this process as well. I know you guys know how to do this already. We've done it once and it was, you know, at least for our site, it was fairly smooth and successful. Um, and so we'd just like to make sure that we're seeing that level of detail again and that we have something written for the record to make sure that we're looking at demobilization, particularly because I know there are concerned community members who are here um, who've come to our 
both this meeting and to the council meetings regularly. So I want to make sure that they have that as well. We'd be glad to work with the office to start scheduling those as soon as we have. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, unless there's additional questions, you have one. Go ahead, Councilmember. Yeah, no, and, and and I appreciate all the the comments. Obviously, you know, it was very compelling testimony when the uh, students and and folks came in and and raised the concerns. Are there are there actually encampments in front of the grant now or in front of the school, or is that is that area clear? To, to my knowledge, there are not encampments around the grant. Yeah. Or or in front of the school. We've visited several times now. We, not that to my knowledge. When I drove by last night, there were not. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, and we look forward to he uh, having uh, regular updates on this in, in our meetings. Okay. Um, we thank have. You. Thank you. So, is there anything we need to do on this item? Uh, I believe Councilman Rodriguez had an instruction that we'd have to approve to vote okay, to approve sure. on. Um, do we have a second? I'll, I'll second it. Uh, Councilmember Raman. Oh, yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee absent. Uh, this item is approved. Thank okay, you. great. And I believe that with that, unfortunately, I'm losing all my other members. Is that correct? I can give you another well, we got everything, right? 10 minutes. We have just the ULA ERAP presentation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, can, so, can, okay, so if we can have LAHD come to the table for item 15, we can finish this up. Um, I want to just make sure that we're moving forward with this. And if I could request that the presentation be as brief as possible, just to honor my fellow committee members' uh, external commitments. And if uh, you could read that item into the record. Yes, Madam Chair. Item number 15 is a verbal report from the Los Angeles Housing Department regarding the United to House LA Emergency Rental Assistance Program and LHD's new publicly available housing data dashboards. Great, thank you. And I did want to say that um, both for Inside Safe and for ULA, I've requested um, that more regular presentations be made at full council. And so I'm hopeful that as we move forward that everyone on the council will be able to hear what we are hearing here in this committee in terms of the, uh, how, the way in which the money is being spent. But please go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. Anna Ortega, assistant general manager of the housing department. Uh, our first piece of information has to do with revenues. Uh, good afternoon, or good, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, uh, it's good to see you all. So, uh, revenue today, um, the most recent numbers, uh, most recent full numbers we have are for November. In November, uh, we collected 13 million point seven uh, on 36 transactions. That was clearly a dip from October's high number of 29.2. Um, what that brings us to for the fiscal year is 127.1 uh, million, and then for the total, uh, since April 1, the commencement of the tax, uh, we we're at 142.7, near the 150 uh, that has been allocated um, and we should be able to cover. Um, my only note, uh, in talking with the Office of Finance um, and others, uh, it is <coughs> precarious to read too much into uh, the patterns and the up and down swings. We're going to see that. We don't know still how much of a chill effect the litigation has had, um, and we'll obviously be tracking assiduously moving forward. We are also starting up with the Office of Finance, the auditing process of looking back um, at deeds and making sure that folks have paid that are supposed to pay. Okay, So great. I'm happy to answer questions, but I'm going to pass it on. So um, the point of that was to put it into context of where we are with, um, with the funds allocated for the rental assistance. The rental assistance program uh, application period for landlords, that was added as, a, as an additional component closed on October 31st. Since then, we this is a kind of a su broad summary of the numbers. So we had a total of 31,361 applications overall, total applications. We had a little over 5,000 uh, applications filed by landlords and 26,000 uh, filed by tenants. The total back rent claimed was um, over $472 million. The average back rent of the applications was a little over $15,000. Um, as of last week, we had paid out about $5 million. And um, the breakdown of the applicants, tenant applicants, was 
um, overwhelmingly from households at or below 30% of AMI, about 90% of the applications are at, from households at the lowest income uh, level. Another 4% or so are from um, households at 50% of AMI, and a tiny 1% of the applications received were from tenants at 1% of AMI. I should have uh, led um, by saying that this information is all publicly available now on the LAHD website. So there is a ULA ERAP dashboard at the website and um, this information is being updated weekly. So it's actually a little bit out of date today, but um, these are the numbers um, thus far. So we are deep into the processing of landlord and tenant applications. Um, we, we have a very high demand for the program. We are prioritizing applications per the uh, guidelines uh, adopted by the Citizens Oversight Committee and the City Council, which um, require prioritization of households at the lowest income at or below 30% of the area median income households with minor children, seniors, and, and uh, people with disabilities. Those are the primary target groups. And due to the demand, those are probably the um, applicants that we are going to be able to serve with this funding. As you may recall, initially 18.4 million was approved for rental assistance, and then the council um, approved an additional 12 million. So right now, there is funding of about $30 million for rental assistance. Um, other priorities include households that are extremely rent burdened, paying more than 50% of their total household income for rent, households at high risk of becoming homeless, households for whom six months rent subsidy in its entirety will satisfy their entire rent debt for the unit they currently inhabit or who have entered into an agreement to repay the remaining balance. So um, we are processing applications in priority order. Um, as I mentioned, payments are going out. Um, this presentation says that we've paid out about five million. That's as of last, uh, last week. We, um, thus far, as of today, have actually paid or have in progress 6.4 million. Um, and when do you expect the rest of that to be processed, given the deadline? It's going to be over the next several weeks and even months. Some information about the um, applications that we paid is provided on this slide. It um, also shows, and you will be able to see on the dashboard, the applications and uh, payments going out by council district. So CD4 right now has the highest level of payments, followed by CD10 and CD13. This is pretty commensurate with the number of rental units in the council districts. Um, of the applications, about 28% of the applications were from Hispanic households, 32% were from African American households, and 22% were from Caucasian households, and 5% were from Asian households. Um, so you can see both the applications and the payments on the dashboard. This is what the dashboard actually looks like. Um, a lot of parts of it are interactive and can be sorted or can be downloaded. The um, black numbers right in the middle are, um, represent all of the applications received and without revealing any personally identifying information for the applicants. But as time goes on, that will be able to show what the outcome was for all of the applications. Uh, at the bottom of that is the payments by council district. And again, there's demographics and other valuable information there. We are getting a lot of questions about um, applicant status. And again, on the LHD um, webpage, Tenants and landlords can check the status of their application. Um, there's a button right there, that blue button on the left. It says check the status of a ULA application and you can click on that and find out where the application is. The public can also call our hotline or email us. On the right side of this, it's 
I guess very hard to see, but it um, shows the information needed to look up an application and it has a um, uh, glossary for the definition of the different stages of applications. And so that is a summary. And this is, that's what a user sees when they come in and look at their application, they can look up the status. Exactly, they just okay. need a few pieces of information, their um, application number or um, uh, their zip code and I believe their phone number. So there's different ways you can get to the application that you're inquiring about. That is a very quick presentation of what's on the dashboard. We're really happy that it's up and it will provide detailed information um, as time goes on. Again, we are updating it weekly. We also have um, the eviction filing dashboard if you would like to see sure. some of that. Um, what is your pleasure? Well, let's stick to this because I think there may be at least a couple questions on this and I know people have to leave. Um, I just had one question which is, uh, why is it taking several weeks to process applications and if a tenant has qualified and is waiting to be processed, what is, you know, what happens then? What happens, like does the land, is the landlord notified? Do they have to opt in? How does this work? Yes, well, uh, yes. Um, remember when, when we had the applications open, tenants could just apply and put in their basic information or they could apply and upload their backup documentation. So uh, there is a whole procedure and process for tenant notifications that they met the initial eligibility. If they didn't submit, I'm um, sorry, I got it off the, the um, that's okay, it's fine. Anyway, if they didn't supply all of their information up front, then they are asked for information they can upload it or they can make an appointment to go to one of the family source centers and have their information uploaded at the center. So there's an in-person option. Um, then once the tenant is uh, determined to be eligible, the landlord is notified and the landlord also, this in, under this program, both the landlord and the tenant have to agree to participate. So there is a whole series of steps that have to happen in reviewing the tenant's application and then notifying the landlord and getting the landlord to opt in. Okay. We sometimes send reminders to people to let them know that we're waiting for a particular piece of information. Uh, in certain cases, tenants are able to self-attest to their qualifications, but again, we're careful and we have to do our due diligence that people do meet the qualifications. I think especially in view of the very, very high demand, we do need to um, prioritize the the applicants according to the guidelines that both the council and the COC have set. So it's underway. Um, there are a series of notifications. The, our ability to process them quickly also depends on both the tenant and the landlord providing the information necessary to, to process and approve the application. But payments are going out. We do expect that it'll, it will accelerate in the next, in coming weeks. Okay. Um, I have some other questions that are based on frequently asked questions that are coming into our office, but maybe we can work together offline, given how late it is today, to answer those and make those publicly available both on the LHD website and on council office website for people who are seeking more information about this program. But I'm pleased to see that the dashboard is available, I'm pleased to see that the eviction filing dashboard is also available based on the information that we started collecting last year. Um, and I think this will be really useful in terms of understanding how we can intervene in these issues going forward. Barring any other issues or questions, I think um, thank you for being patient um, and waiting to make your presentation. And I think we can, we're done with this. Oh, okay, yes. So there's no action necessary for this item, Madam Great. Chair, but to clarify for item number one, it was actually a discussion item as well, so the committee could not actually take action on that item. So Got that it. vote that we took was invalid. It would be an unofficial request from the council. That's fine, yeah, but I think they'll be answering the questions Great. anyway, so yeah. we're good. Other Thank that, you so much. Thank you, and with that, uh, any, are there any other items? The desk is clear, Madam Chair. Amazing, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>